Welcome to historical Bowling Green. Today we have a special event going on where the city of New York was founded here in this historical site right behind us and where the revolution, uh, where the last British soldiers and the last British flag was taken down right here in historical Bowling Green. And for the last 19 years, I have helped organize in uh, celebrating the Turkish Independence Day of modern Turkey. And uh, today we are congregated in finding out that in the latter part of the Ottoman Empire, there was a Council General's building located here in the Wall Street area. And, 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 and also a mosque, a Turkish Ottoman mosque that was located just a couple of blocks up from here, from Bowling Green. And this research was put together by a young lady, by a professor, by the name of Professor Ishil Ajehan. And I'd like to introduce her and welcome her to Bowling Green and let her talk about what her research has discovered. And with that, Professor, uh, we will welcome you. Uh, I'm working on the early Ottoman Turkish immigrants in the United States who came in the late 19th century and early 20th century. And then many of them also uh, settled in here in New York uh, and in other states like Massachusetts and um, Detroit, etc. Uh, so we are in here today to uh, recognize the uh, existence of early Turkish immigrants in this time we've done the Ottoman history tour. So we're looking forward to that and we're excited to raise the flag. So let's, let's do it. My name is Todd Fine. I'm a historian, a PhD student in history at the uh, City University of New York. Uh, I study mostly Arab American literature, uh, little, the little Syrian neighborhood. But we've started to realize that there is enough Ottoman history here and diff many different uh, groups from the Ottoman Empire who were living, working in lower Manhattan, that we can start to tell a proper story about Ottoman New York. And my colleague here, Dr. Ashalachahan is probably one of the premier experts in the world on the Turkish immigration to the United States. And so this knowledge and the knowledge of the Arab Americans is starting to blend together. So I'll let her introduce herself. Hi, my research is on the early Turkish immigrants in the United States. Uh, actually, you know, although people know that there were uh, uh, several uh, immigrants in the U.S. Uh, from the Ottoman Empire. Turks were not recognized or known uh, well before this research and after that now we are trying to co reconstruct the world of the Turks, you know, actually the Ottoman diaspora as a, uh, as a whole in the U.S. One way, to think, one way to think about the Ottoman New York is to talk about the people and we are going to talk a lot about Ottoman people living here, Greeks, Armenians, Turks, Syrians, the whole gamut. But we, we also need to, I think, start from the idea that in a way the United States and the British and the, the Dutch defined themselves, their, their ideas of who they were as a people and what the colony that they, colonies that they were created here in the Americas against 
the Ottoman power. In the, you know, in the 19th century, we think of the, the Ottoman power as a declining power versus the West and, and the, the World War I and that politics. But we need to remember that when New York was founded in, 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 in 16, uh, in the early, you know, in the early 17th century, the Ottoman power was the major power, much larger and more important than the British and the Dutch, and they created their identity based on that. And even the early commerce of the Americas was based on the financial wealth of the Ottoman Empire. So, and so the reason we start at this location, not only because this is the Custom House, which is uh, the same site as the original Fort Amsterdam of, 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 of New Amsterdam, the original Dutch colony, but because this this building, which was built by Cass Gilbert, includes these uh, these four sculptures representing each continent. And this is the continent of, of Africa that represents Asia. There's also Africa over there, you can see with the thing. But Asia, represented with a poppy seed in her in her uh, right hand, which was emblematic of, of, in the 19th century, late 19th century, of this export that they were concerned about out of it. But also, if you step back, you see that she's standing on the skull. She's, she's, her empire is based on death, and she has slaves, and she, she's an emblematic of this notion of the Turk and the Asia being the evil representation while we being pure. And this it's important to note just how much of American discourse throughout its whole history has been based against democracy versus the evil Turk. Has anybody ever heard of Anthony Von Sely, the Turk? You have. So interestingly, one of the most notorious uh, citizens of New Amsterdam was the son of a, of, of, a, of a Dutch pirate. And Anthony, in this Atlantic world mixed with uh, you know, pirates and trade, ended up in New Amsterdam. And he became one of the most famous representatives of New Amsterdam because he was involved in more in 20% of the criminal cases. He was always like, he, he was always uh, getting into fights and he was uh, giving people bad deals. So historians of New Amsterdam are obsessed with this guy, but they called him the Turk there. So that's, that's just one representation of, of this Turkish idea. But it goes to the point, one of the key points is Americans and we're calling everybody Turks. Whether you are Syrian, Armenian, during the Ottoman period they didn't make these distinctions Turks. So Syrians especially, but also Armenians and Greeks, start to come in the 1880s. Um, Ishil can describe, will describe some of the origins, but for the, for, for the first 20 years, they called them all Turks. And they heard that, you know, there were jobs in here, and then when they came in here, they could find a job easily, and they will uh, succeed, and they will earn lots of money, and then they, they could go back to their country. So they started mig migrating together. First, the Armenians started, and then the Turks and Kurds, you know, Muslims, uh, began following them. And actually, when they settled in here, they stayed in the same houses. They worked together. For example, there are like immig Turkish uh, immigrants uh, who are telling that they found jobs in a Greek restaurant. So, because you know the culture is the same, and uh, the, this was this Anatolian culture that they shared together, and language also. They were all Turkish-speaking people. Uh, so that's how they came, and uh, many of them came through the Ellis Island. Uh, from yeah to New York, and then uh, so uh, it, it was like it started in late 19th century, like 1880s. But most of the Turks, especially, came in early 20th century, like uh, 1907, 1908. Right. But their presence actually is not known uh, at all because it's believed that you know many of them returned to their uh, home countries. Country, but uh, actually, my research sh shows that they stayed in here, they succeeded, they opened businesses, but uh, somehow they were forgotten for years. Right. Now, by the 1890s, when you would walk, you know, you, all immigrants to the United States came through Ellis Island. When they walked up off the battery, they would start seeing Arabic script immediately because. In the 1880s, uh, 
the, the Syrian population especially, but also Armenians, Greeks, created in Lower Manhattan the Syrian Quarter. And they had replaced Irish and Germans in what was eventually early, which were in ho homes in some cases that were early mansions from the early Republic, right after the Revolutionary War. And so after we go through some of the Ottoman consulate buildings and some of the Ottoman stations, we're going to complete the tour in the Syrian Quarter. This, this was the location of, of a couple of buildings that had many consul generals stationed here. And they, th these were buildings are from the 1880s. They're no longer here, but there are two buildings together, the Chesaboro buildings. And this is 24 State Street and 17 State Street. And so up until around 1906, uh, the Turkish consul general was in this building at 17, and then after 1906 we see them in this building. You know, one of the things that's fascinating about the Consul General is they are, many of them are very interesting personalities, and I don't know if this comes from the ability that they have to get money, you know, there was some corruption, or just the, what it took to get to that level of the, of the Ottoman Foreign Ministry. But we're going to talk a little bit about some of the personalities. But I think before we do that, we do want to mention that up until about the late mid of 1890s, the Ottoman Empire was actually officially opposed to to Syrians, but most Ottoman citizens immigrating to the to the United States. They were worried about brain drain. They were worried about uh, about also losing political control. And the Syrians, for at, at the start when they started to immigrate, in particular, had to do uh, special maneuvers to escape the Ottoman Empire. At that time, they had a passport that only allowed them to go to internal ports within the Ottoman state. They couldn't use it for foreign ports. But what European ships would do would, would be to go to Beirut and say, we are just going to go to some other Ottoman imperial port, and then actually they would just leave and take them to Marseille. And then when they were in Marseille, they would probably go to the, the Ottoman consul there and bribe them to get a proper passport so that they could come to America. By the mid-1890s, the Syrians were doing so well economically in the United States, as well as Armenians and Greeks, that I think they said, this is, this, these, these remittances, this money they're sending back, is so important to the economy of Syria, it would be self-destructive for us to stop this. Is that when we talk about Syria, we're talking about greater Syria, which includes Palestine, parts of Jordan, and the largest group of Syrians are Mount Le people from Lebanon today, Mount Lebanon, mostly Christians. But more Muslims than people think, and a lot more Muslims than some of the Lebanese Christian types would like you to believe. Well, I would like to tell about Shahmir Efendi. Actually, he came to uh, to New York in early uh, 20th century, in like uh, 1901, and then he loved Manhattan. He was from Kayseri and <laughs> from Talas, from my hometown, deputy council first. And uh, in 1906, Abdul Hamid posted him as uh, to the uh, diplomatic mission as a deputy council. And actually, he was an uh, interesting figure. Uh, for example, when the uh, Turkish and U.S. relations were cut off uh, as a result of the war, and when uh, you know Germany, uh, when Turkey declared war, actually when the U.S. Uh, entered war, and uh, he served for like ten years uh, for the interests of the Turk, Turkey, Tur uh, Turkish uh, Ottoman Empire, and in 1927 uh, he. Um, and he was posted to, uh, to somewhere else. We are now at 59 Pearl Street, which is the location of the Ottoman consulate. And they were in this building that was called the Importers Export Building. It's not there anymore, but uh, it's right across the street from the famous Francis Tavern. But here you can see a picture of the building with the Francis Tavern. And the consul general here, his name was Munji Bey. Munji Bey. And he was probably the most colorful of the uh, Ottoman consul generals, both because he was uh, 
notorious among the Syrians for being a little bit corrupt and being involved in bribes. He lived a crazy lifestyle uh, living in the Waldorf Astoria. People are wondering how does this consul general get to live in Waldorf Astoria? And uh, he was also the consul during some very crazy events associated with the Young Turk Revolution. He was a uh, literary man also. He was a writing publishing and you know books and he was a journalist too and he had expensive lifestyle so uh, even in the newspapers of that time uh, it was said that he was always complaining that you know the consular fees were not enough for him so he was you know thinking about other uh, uh, occupations and uh, actually he was posted uh, to New York in 19 uh, hundred and then uh, after like 1908 he was posted to New York again um, right. so yeah during the Young Turk Revolution he was in here actually some people believe that he was a Young Turk too but many people say that it was just before you know he loved power so he was supporting who was in power at the time and uh, he actually uh, wa wanted to uh, get the Ottoman uh, ambassador uh, in the Turkish legation in uh, Washington DC. He just removed him from his job uh, when the Young Turk Revolution happened. Yeah, he went down to Washington and said, yeah. I'm now in control in, the rev in support exactly. of the revolution. Yeah. You know, obviously this was a momentous event and it created some uncertainty about who was in control of the Consul General. But what's most important is because of this large Ottoman presence of immigrants, of Armenians especially, who were, many of them were active revolutionaries who wanted the downfall of the regime, but also Greeks and Syrians who had been opposed to the regime, they had, they, the Turks saw this revolution, the, the Ottoman, the, the young Turks, as a male, as an opportunity maybe. Maybe these people will come back. Maybe they will start, you know, bringing business back. They've, they've done very well in the United States. The Syrians did very well commercially in the United States, often starting from peddling to, to creating vast import-export businesses, manufacturing in silk robes and kimonos, all from lower Manhattan. So, so, um, so from this, this consul general, um, Nunji Bey issued the following uh, declaration after the Young Turk Revolution. Inform all fugitive Turkish citizens in New York City and in all the United States, including political fugitives without regard to race or nationality, whether Greek, Armenian, Turkish, Albanian, everything, that after promulgation of a constitution for the Turkish Empire, His Majesty the Sultan, upon request of the government, has granted general amnesty and all political fugitives may go back to Turkey after obtaining the necessary passports verified at the office of the the Turkish Consul General, 59 Pearl Street, New York. And he was in the papers telling everybody that now um, the, the Turkey had, would become like the United States. He said, Turkey is now as free as the United States. The Constitution granted in my country is like that of England and France. It grants amnesty to all her political refugees. Let those who work for the good of the country return. And so in August of 2008, they had a big parade and a celebration in the little Syria quarter in the, where we're going to go with, with uh, uh, confetti and everything and speakers and food all day celebrating the revolution. Now, as you, we all know, or most people know, by 1909, there are mass, you know, there are deaths of Armenians, and there's, there's, the Syrians are changing their mind. They're here to make money. They don't want to go back in, when there's un instability. So none of these, these plans really worked, and eventually the consulate started focusing more on the few, relatively few, but not insubstantial Muslim Turks. And we're going to talk more about that when we go to the mosque. Uh, Morris Shinasi. Morris Shinasi. He was in the tobacco business, and then he was the first person bringing Turkish tobacco, introducing Turkish tobacco to the United States. Okay, he was born in Manisa, uh, and he was Jewish. He was born into a Jewish family, and they were very poor. They, they were specialized, and they uh, invented actually a, a machine which was about, which was for rolling cigarettes. And in 1893, there was a fair in Chicago. 
and it was like an industrial fair, a Colombian exhibition. Uh, it was for the anniversary, the 1400 anniversary of the uh, of the Colom of Colombia, you know, uh, yeah, Columbus, uh, and introduced his rolling machine. And after that, they actually, they decided to remain in the United States, and then they moved to New York, and they opened the first cigarette factory in this location in 1893. He was born as a poor boy, and then he became a mogul after that, and this was the uh, the cigarette uh, he was uh, producing. And it has some, you know, Egyptian figures because uh, he wanted to, uh, you know make it feel like an Egyptian cigarette. One thing I wanted to add was that the Colombian exhibition played a big role in this Turkish aesthetic that became very popular in the United States in the late 19th century. One way was you started to see the rich of New York uh, start to uh, uh, make uh, Turkish smoking parlors in their homes, right? And they have the Nargila, and the Nargilas, there start to be these hookah bars in the United States in the 1890s. The Syrians were doing that, people were smoking marijuana, they were, they, it was getting involved with prostitution, uh, it was a very, and a lot of these guys who actually made the money, there was a big Iraqi, the Chaldean Christians, who, who, who also got in big tobacco, but they started by running these very strange uh, hookah bars that were, maybe a lot of people accused, with prostitution up in the tenderloin. You know, people say New York is like an onion and you peel it back and I think that's one of the things that we talking about is you know with the Muslim population people say oh Muslims are new there couldn't be Muslims well we're about to take you to a place where the Ottoman Empire established a mosque in lower Manhattan and everybody has gone through New York in the 1790s the early aughts these these new streets Greenwich Street Washington Street and then West Street were built and Greenwich Street here became the millionaire's row of the early republic. Big the federal row mansions, people like DeWitt Clinton and all the big merchant elite. And we actually right here have one of the last uh, federal mansions left, uh, 17, uh, from about 17 in the late 90s. And these are the type of buildings that these poor immigrants would have filled up. And you can see that they were all connected, there, there wasn't much ventilation. But these, all these mansions were filled up by Irish and German immigrants and then the Syrians and all the other Ottoman ethnicities and the other groups. Washington Street is the major street of the Syrian quarter. Said, well, this is, this is all Christian story. There were, if there were any Muslims, it was very small, insignificant. There could never be a mosque. But I, you know, a few other people, uh, myself and others, figured, well, you know, anytime you talk about Ottomans, there's so many different types of people, you're going to find a diversity. It turned out that in 1912, in the New York Sun, there's a newspaper article entitled, Mohammedans Now Have a Place of Worship Here. And it's all about this location, 17 Rector Street, about how the Ottoman consulate had opened a mosque here. Uh, on the, on, this was a, the building wasn't there, it was a kind of a, a merchant, it was an import-export house called the Oriental, but on the third floor there was a room that had full outfitting for a masjid, and they had um, ceremonies on the major holidays. And they had an imam, Mehmed Ali, who was tasked... He was very educated, he knew like six languages and he could speak English very well and he, he was like a very you know, intellectual imam, you know. When you think of imams these days, you cannot you know, uh, consider a person like this. <coughs> and then he actually, he had a jamaat in here. He had, he had some people like among Syrians, Turks, and you know, among other, the other uh, Muslims, he, had, he was uh, preaching them and then uh, they were gathering in here. Another group that I should add is that there was another segment for the Muslim population would have been uh, sailors on British ships from different Ottoman countries, which would have included uh, from Sudan, from Yemen, from India. Um, so there was enough Muslims kind of wandering around lower Manhattan in the, 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 when this was still a major port area that at one point the Ottoman said, you know, we need to take responsibility for this. And I think it's not a coincidence that it happened at the same time that that 
po that politics of reaching the Christian diasporas, the Armenians and the Syrians, was failing. So one of the things you see in that article in the New York Sun is that Mehmet Ali is making a claim to immigrants in the United States on the basis of loyalty to the caliphate, saying if you're loyal to your religion, you're going to be loyal to the caliphate. So and then they were saying that why, you know, Christians have all these missionaries and all these religious you know, uh, buildings in our empire. Why don't we build a mosque, a proper mosque in New York that, you know, yeah. people will see that, you know, Islam, you know, also Muslims are in here. So he was uh, getting donations from the Turkish uh, communities all around uh, the U.S. But when the war uh, started in 1914, they had to send this money to Turkey to support the war. Um, the other thing is, of course, after the war, you have this xenophobia in the United States about anarchists and these, these European problems. And in 1924, there is a ban on basically all immigration from Asia. People mostly talk about you know, bans of Jewish immigration, and, but that, that same immigration law of 1928 banned immigration from Asia. And the reason that we don't talk about the little Syria today like we talk about Little Italy or Chinatown is because the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. Some people may have heard of Robert Moses, who was this famous uh, kind of dictator of New York City who controlled the Triborough, the Parks Department. He brought the car to New York, and his plan originally was to build a bridge over Battery Park, destroying Battery Park to, to do this. Federal, uh, during World War II, FDR, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, they agreed to do a tunnel instead. But the tunnel uh, demolished the lower streets of Washington Street, which is the residential part of the Syrian quarter. Anyway, we do have traces of the Syrian quarter left, and this is actually a Syrian church. This is St. George Syrian Catholic Church. Now, um, of the Syrians, there were three main religious groups. There were Maronite Christians, some people may know the Maronites, they're descended from this St. Maron. Um, they're, they're part of Rome, but priests can marry, and their church was demolished about down at uh, 69. Now, today, this beautiful Byzantine church, which was established in 19, um, which established in 1925, with its exterior done by a Lebanese architect, Harvey Kassab, in 1930, is currently a bar and a Chinese restaurant. But we do have to be careful of the last historic buildings because we've lost so much. And we, we thought that this church should be protected. Look at the beauty of this architecture. But also this middle building, which is a settlement house uh, that provided social services for the immigrants of this quarter. And 109 Washington Street, which was uh, which one of the last tenements of these blocks that had dozens and dozens of tenements. But we have advocated that this be a city landmark, but it's not and it's not protected. And there's very little protected in Lower Manhattan compared to other parts of the city. These two buildings are not. And in the context of total demolition of everything else in this area, we believe it should also be protected. There was actually a Greek church that was destroyed in the September 11th attacks. So, oddly enough, there was, um, it, it was an old building from the early 19th century. It was actually a bar that became a church. And so they built, they've been building, uh, Santiago Calatrava, the same architect who did the Oculus, you know, the dove-shaped path station, has developed a, this design, which is inspired by Hagia Sophia, Hagia Sophia, uh, and is going to be kind of a modernistic take on it, which is interesting because a lot of people, they look at this and say, that looks like a mosque. And one of the things, you know, we would like people to know, a lot of people are coming to the World Trade Center, they're going to say, why is there this big church there? You know, why is there this cross? Well, it's important to note that there's a Greeks here because there's Syrians here and because this is an Ottoman kind of zone of uh, communities who are doing trade together. and. It would be great if we're hoping that there's a sign maybe in this park, this is this overhead park, explaining, you know, that this is Liberty Park, this used to be an immigrant neighborhood of, of Ottoman peoples. We just scratched the surface. One of the things I realized in a question is I didn't even get into all the journalistic politics of Syrians opposing the Ottoman Empire, going to Paris and in opposition. I, we could go on and on about, we could talk about spies, spying on Syrians. Yeah. We could talk about Syrians who maybe returned to the Ottoman to visit, who ran a newspaper, who were assassinated by the Turks. I mean, there's some hard international history. It's not all 
you know, uh, you know, fun and games. But that said, I think as historians, we're in agreement that people, people work together and live together and intermarry and there's so many stories of intermarriage of businesses working together we went to a jewish you know a jewish cigarette factory there are syrians we talked about a mosque and people always get together so despite the politics focus that's what we want to say that this ottoman the ottoman new york is really people living and working together and dealing with each other and politics makes the the history books but it's only a small part of the real story which is people's lives and it's a great it's a great american story so thank you all for coming thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you too, too.